Hello, this is Mike at Game From Scratch, and welcome to part two of our Paradox Game Engine tutorial series. Uh, today we're just going to kind of do an overview, a getting started. I'm going to show you around the tools, uh, make you comfortable with how Paradox works, and then in the next one we'll jump into actually you know, making game type stuff. Uh, so if you're already comfortable with Paradox, skip ahead. If you watch my introduction video, uh, my uh, closer look at Paradox Studio um, video from GameFromScratch.com, or YouTube channel, skip ahead. I've covered everything that I'm going to cover today there. The big difference is I'm going to be very focused today. I'm going to try and keep this 5 to 10 minutes in length um, like I'm going to do with all of the tutorials in this series. Uh, for each tutorial, by the way, that you read a video, you watch a video for, there's also a text-based version and vice versa. Um, so if you need the reference type thing of what I've just done, just head on over um, to uh, GameFromScratch.com, and you'll find the Paradox tutorial section. I'll make a, t a table of contents eventually if I haven't already. And you can find the text equivalent there. Uh, so without further ado, let's jump in. Uh, this here is Paradox Studio. Uh, Paradox is sort of a two-part process. First off, there is the code that runs behind the scenes. We're going to get into the code a little bit later. We're actually going to cover everything here in a bit more detail later on too. So I just want you to have a, like a top level view, understand what each of these pieces is and the basics of how to use it and that's it. Um, but basically Paradox, its project file is a Visual Studio solution. You don't need Visual Studio installed to make this work. Uh, however, it is definitely uh, useful for you to have it. Now this here is Paradox Studio. Paradox Studio is where you compose your assets, uh, you create your game entities, or your, you can, you can also do this in code by the way, uh, but here's where you can create your game entities. Things like um, models in your game, or sprites, or lights, or cameras, etc. You can create them all here in this, uh, this uh, product, uh, which again is called Paradox Studio. And let me just give you a quick overview of what each of these pieces is. Follow the mouse cursor over here, uh, this is your scene view. This is where basically all of the stuff that make up your world exist. Uh, this is a very simple scene. This is the Hello World example that ships with it. Um, and there are a ton of examples, by the way. So if you go over to the, uh, the launcher, when you click Start, um, there's about 25, 30 different examples to get you started. Hopefully with this tutorial series, eventually you won't need them. Uh, but they are probably the best learning source out there right now. Uh, but this here is your your editing environment and this as I said is your scene graph this is where you create the entities that make up your world now paradox is uh, an entity component system it's, it's on vogue it's what most game engines are using right now basically where an entity is a thing in the world made up of components um, so you add functionality to an entity by adding components to it so you can actually make and this button right here is to create a new entity you can create an empty entity if you want see and the thing about this entity is it is in space. It, it just, it can contain components and it has a position. And that's what makes it an entity. But if you s go back here to the, the new, you can also see you can create 3D models, uh, point lights, uh, cameras, 2D entities, and audio entities, listeners and emitters. Uh, so those are basically just pre-configured entities with the components for their functionality. And this here is an empty component. And we'll see how that works in a second when we get over here to the properties grid. Uh, next down here, you have your Solution Explorer. If you've worked in um, Visual Studio, you totally get what this is. Uh, this is the file level overview of the project and its dependencies. So it's dependent on the Paradox game engine, and you've got access to assets from the base Paradox uh, package. Uh, you could create your own. Um, you can create folders. You can create uh, packages, or you can create assets here. And we'll get to that in a second. So I could create a new asset here by uh, right click and create and then the type of asset I want. So you see you got here like uh, animations, uh, physics colliders, uh, effect shaders, materials, uh, full scenes, uh, etc. All of these things can be created. And then over here you see the asset view. So if I was to go ahead right here and create a new uh, texture, it will show up here in the asset view. Uh, I don't want to, so let's just go ahead and get rid of that guy. So here you see the two assets that are available in our scene. You got your, your scene itself, which is represents this entire structure right here, is also just an asset. So you can have nested scenes within your scene, uh, etc. But this is where the raw assets for your game is. And here is the uh, texture background, this, basically this thing. Um, 
is where that's coming in. So here's your asset view. Here's where you maintain and create new assets for your game. And using them is ultra simple. I forgot to shut off my mail and this is getting annoying. Uh, but using them is ultra simple. Uh, you can easily just go over here and do new, bring it in and create the settings accordingly. Or you can even drag and drop. So let's go into downloads. And right here I've got uh, this FBX file. Uh, so it's from uh, 3D Studios Max or Maya or whatever. And just go ahead and drag and drop it in. And you'll see it recognizes that it's an FBX asset that needs to be imported. Uh, it gets all the different components because there's a lot of stuff that goes together to make a 3D model, right? All the various different textures, the animation, uh, and then the model itself, as you can see here. And finish. And boom, all of those textures are now in your world. And the other thing you can use assets for, let me just select one, is here's my 3D model asset, which is all of these things combined. Uh, once you've got your assets defined, instantiating them or creating an instance of them in your world is as simple as drag and drop. So now my 3D model is in the world. Done. So there, your asset view is where all of your, um, your assets, your reusable pieces of game are organized. And you can instantiate them by dragging them into the 3D view. Um, or by selecting them, you can see over here in the property grids, uh, that their editable settings come up. And I'll come back to this guy in one second, so just pretend it doesn't exist. Now down here, uh, you can see the references and referencers. And this is for figuring out what is using a particular asset. So if I go ahead, um, select this guy, nothing, let's see. Why am I, okay, let's grab this guy. Okay, so this is a texture being used by this model. And if we go over here to references, you can see the things that are using it, so the normal map is using it. Uh, this It's being used as a texture on the bottom of that model, etc. And it's used by the model. So this is how you can see how a particular asset, uh, the dependencies it's got in the scene. Next up, you've also got a couple tabs across the bottom. Action history is just what you've done. Uh, and then finally, asset preview allows you to see the particular asset you've got. So if I go back to my model, you can see the model in 3D. You use left mouse button, pan around, middle mouse button, zoom in and out. So, oh sorry, orbit around to the left. Uh, so you can see a 3D model going on here, or you can bring in uh, like a material and see how it would look on various different shapes. So it's a way of visualizing your assets in, um, in game as it stands. Uh, so those are your three settings down here. Now we've gone back up to this 3D view and this is where your world exists. You can see here, you've got your three different axis indicators. So Y is up, important concept. So if your 3D modeling package does not use Y up uh, by default, you're gonna have to change that on import or export. Every single package supports um, the export setting as for changing the Y up axis. Otherwise it's a negative 90 degree rotation. It's not a really big deal changing that, but just be aware that different packages use different axis orientation. Uh, and this is your 3D view. This is where you compose your world. Now, it could potentially be absolutely empty. If, if you're doing all of your code programmatically, you could have nothing in your world if you wanted. Right here, you're seeing a, a camera preview. So if there's a camera in the world, um, she'll preview down here. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, you left click to select an item, like so. When you add an item, you'll see the manipulator comes up here. Uh, so you can grab and move along that individual axis by left clicking and dragging. So I can move it. Z axis here, Y axis here. I can grab it in the middle and move it freely on all axis. Uh, standard, pretty standard. It uses the, that, that this is from Maya. So basically it's ripping off the UI from Maya. Everything is ripping the UI off from Maya these days. So uh, that's not a slight by any means on Paradox Studio. Um, but you'll see right here, you've got translate, you've got rotate. You got a set of gizmos for each orientation as well. Or, uh, doesn't look like you can do an independent rotation. So, like so. Now, you've got scale as well. And ditto, you can scale on all axis or on a single axis as you wish. Now, these guys are controlled by a hotkey as well. So, QWE, as in QWERTY, the Q is select mode, W is move mode. Why are you not moving? So, there. So, Q is select, W goes into translate, E goes into rotate, and then R goes into scale. Uh, next up, you've got snapping. Uh, this allows you to move in segments. 
So let me just go back, press W, so I'm in translate mode. And now you'll notice as I, why is snapping not on? Lock, snap, one. Yeah, there we go. It's snapping in one unit increment. So it's a good way to align to a grid, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's snapping right there. Uh, next up, you've got some things here to control how this orientation works. Uh, you can set it based off of the world, locally, or the camera, or orientated to the camera. Uh, so those are your three different select modes, so how uh, translations will happen relative uh, are controlled by these three guys. Uh, you can control how, the, how it's shown, the lighting effects not shown, or etc. cetera, uh, material, visibility, et cetera. Uh, you can change the, the layout of the gizmo. Let's go back to local. And then finally, you can flip camera angles. I have no idea where I'm actually aimed at this point in time. Now, finally, you can actually orbit your camera. That's so. so your controls here are on the 3D view. Left mouse button is your orbit, like so. And you do up and down, like so. And then we've got this sec. So your scroll wheel zooms in and out. Or, okay, right left mouse button orbits, apparently right mouse button orbits as well, middle mouse button uh, scroll, sorry, scroll wheel zooms in and out, middle mouse button is a pan, and I believe it's alt and the right mouse button is also zoom in and out. So these are your basic 3D controls. They're the same from 3D applications, so if you're comfortable with uh, any of the Autodesk 3D applications, this will immediately be obvious to you. Uh, my one complaint is there are no axis indicators, so I don't know where X, Y, and Z intersect, there's no zero. It seems like a very strange oversight. Um, so I don't really understand that particular missing component. But anyways, this is your 3D view. This is mostly where you will position your world. Uh, again, uh, QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T, uh, Q selects, W move, E rotate, uh, T scale, or no, R scale, sorry, um, brings up this widget. You can control the orientation of the widget using these three controls. Uh, and then you can use individual axes to modify along one direction or the centerpiece to modify freely, snapping on and off, etc. So this is where you will assemble the pieces that make up your world. So there's your 3D view. If we had a proper camera, it would be previewed down here. Uh, we don't in this particular case, uh, but that's fine. So now finally, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple more things, and then we're going to be done here. First off, your scene. You go to top level scene, you'll notice that there are a lot of settings for it, especially under graphics. Way beyond what we're going to cover, I'll come back to it, but this is where you can configure how your particular render will work, and this is where you would set your camera as active. When I told you if there was an active camera, it would preview down here. There isn't one. Uh, it'd be easy enough to create one. Just come down, oops, wrong side. Come down here and just create either uh, orthographic or perspective. I'll cover later on what those particular things are. Uh, so there is a camera now in my scene. I can go back to my scene and I can set the camera accordingly by selecting here and then picking the camera. Like so. So now that is the active camera in, okay, there's something going on in the code because it should be now be showing that. But um, And the camera works the same way. Uh, you can see it's view frustrum being drawn in this uh, triangle view. I'll cover cameras again later on, uh, so ignore that for now. Uh, but you can uh, manipulate the camera just like you can any other options. Now another thing that's really important to understand is this is a hierarchy. Um, so your scene now contains all of these different entities. Now we just added a camera to the world. We could in turn add a light to that camera. And let me just show you what I mean. So let's go add a point light to our world. Yeah, let's put it down a bit. Okay, so now you'll notice something because I had camera selected when I did it. The point light is now parented to the camera. So if I grab this camera and I move it, you'll see that point light goes with it. Now, however, I can grab the point light and move it independently like so. But when I grab this camera, because of that parent-child relationship, it will now move with it, inherit its positioning. So very important con understanding, a concept to understand, sorry, is um, this hierarchy, this relationship settings here. Now, the next thing I want to show you is the use of this guy over here. This is very critical. This is where you configure your entities. Remember I added a blank entity before, and there's, every entity has a transform component. This is its position in 3D space. I might be able to get rid of it, but you really wouldn't want to. 
this is what says where an entity is. So you see, as I'm moving it, the x-axis here value is changing. And according, so I could edit this, go back to the origin by just manually setting it to zero and zero. Oops. Come on. So, so coincidentally, there's the origin. Uh, but this is what the transform component does. And as I said earlier, entities are containers or bags for components. So we can add new components to an entity very simply. It's right here, this add component. And I'm going to cover shortly what these components actually do. So I'm not going to get into it in much detail. But I could basically recreate, say, this point light equivalent. So if we look at this point light, this point light is simply a transform. It's, it's an entity with a transform component and a light component. Um, pre-configured for us. So the entity that we created ourselves, this empty entity, we could cr effectively create a point light by simply adding a component of type light and then making it a point light. So now this entity that we created and this pre-configured one that we created this way as a light uh, are identical. Uh, so once again, these entities, these things over here are simply containers for components. Uh, and they all have like a default transform component. So you add new components, new functionality, things like animations, uh, audio, uh, et cetera, to your particular um, entity this way. And then as you add them, they show up down here. You can get rid of them by clicking the X, and we're back to just having a transform. Now, you can also define these yourself. We'll cover that way down the road, uh, but you can create your own as well. Uh, that can be configured and used in the editor. Uh, so it's a pretty powerful uh, concept, and it's a very simple concept to understand. Your game is composed 100% of entities, and those entities are contain containers or um, holders of components. And that's it. Uh, so basically, this is your Paradox Studio. The last thing I want to show you is this property grid. As you see, when we're selecting it this way, we're selecting an entity. Uh, it allows us to compose that entity so we can add components, etc. But when you select an asset within the scene, the values here are going to be much different. So here, for example, we've got this material asset. And you'll see now I can add components to it, but I can configure the things that go into making a material asset. So you've got your geometry, and this is the uh, uh, things like uh, normal maps, etc. Uh, so this actually has a normal map defined. And when you go into it, you know, click and then pick it as active. Uh, you can configure how this material is shaded by setting its diffuse map, its specular map, uh, etc. If you have no idea what any of these things mean, don't worry. I hopefully can cover them in the future. Um, but basically, a diffuse map is your, um, your texture map, if you want to think of it that way. Specular map is the way that light interacts with your object. Um, etc. You can actually have a missive so that your your object actually gives off light. Um, so those are some of the settings that you've got for uh, a material, for example. And then you've got under miscellaneous, uh, occlusion, transparency settings, nothing really that special. And then you've got, you can add layers. Uh, we'll cover the specifics in their appropriate tutorial. But this is essentially how you compose your game. How you script your game, different story. Uh, we could do that in code. I will show that actually next. We're going to look at adding an entity, adding a script to an entity as the next part of this tutorial. And that's where we first start getting into coding. So I just want you to see how uh, game worlds are composed using the studio. So quick overview, scene graph over here, 3D view right here for manipulating and placing items. Uh, Solution Explorer is your overall game. Once again, the top level project type for Paradox Studio is actually, as you can see here, this Hello World by SLN. It's a Microsoft Visual Studio solution file. It's actually what your project is composed of. So if I come in here and go to documents, yeah, Paradox Projects, you'll see here's Hello World. Top level project is the solution file. And then there's more to it. There's um, you know, all of the various, at, there's the asset, the background texture we're using. Um, compiled version, here's your assets. So there's these things like PDX text, all of the assets, all of the, the file formats used within um, Paradox have this PDX prefix on their suffix. Okay, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So the file extension type always starts with a PDX. So the texture is a PDX text. So once I import an image in here, it will create this PDX text. Our scene is a PDX scene, etc. I haven't actually saved, so that's why there's these asterisks here and why you're not seeing this model, all these things being added. So let me just go ahead. So there, and let me just save our project. So all the little asterisks are gone. 
and I kick on back here, and now you'll see all these other things. So that thing we imported, that 3D model, is this PDX M 3D. So it's a PDX model 3D. It, that's how the, the file extensions work. Uh, all of the materials, all of the textures. So this is how your scene is composed. It's on the file system underneath. All of this will take care of you for the most part. The only time you're ever really going to be down in this stuff is if something goes wrong. Uh, and again, here's your package, and this is the, basically this stuff assembled. Um, you can use it in other projects, and import it, etc. as a way of organizing assets together, if you wish. We'll cover that later on as well. Uh, finally, again, you could get into the coding aspects. Uh, that's what this magic button here does. This opens it up in Visual Studio. Uh, this one builds it, so you don't need Visual Studio installed to build the code, and this one runs it. So I don't know what we'll actually get, but let's do a build. All right, so let's get that asset out of the way. So you'll see the progress down here that this code is building. So once I said, as I said earlier, you do not actually have to have Visual Studio installed. Uh, it's integrated for you. So we just built it. That compiled all of the code behind the scenes. And now we can either run it or live script run it. So we'll do a run. And I have no idea what this game's going to look like because I've been mucking with the... It started as the Hello World example, and then I, I dragged and dropped the model on top and created a camera, etc. So yeah, that's all you're going to see is a, basically a texture being displayed. Uh, but this is your game. Oops. This is your game running. Uh, so that's it. That's where I want to leave it. Uh, that is pretty much the basics of creating a uh, or creating assets, anyways, creating and instantiating assets in your game. And the key thing to really take away from this is you got your entities. And your entities are composed of components, and components can use things like here. This component background has a dependency on a texture, and that texture in turn is an asset. So when you click this little hand thing, it'll bring up the asset viewer. So you've got assets, which are things like 3D models, materials, textures, audio files, scenes, etc., are all down here. They can be instantiated at drag and drop, simple enough, or by using them in a component. So you've got your entities over here, which are the things that make up your world. They're instances. So you've got, um, if you had two guys using the same model, you would have two entities. Now, I hope that's clear. So if you had two guys fighting, even if they used the exact same uh, actual assets, you would create you know, player one and player two, for example. Uh, but this then, in turn, owns or is composed of components that you add and configure, or you create your entity this way, which will have a several of them configured for you. And these, in turn, can consume assets, like you see down here. And that's it. That's basically how it works. If you've got your head wrapped around that, you're in a good spot. And next step, we're going to look at the very basics of coding. So I hope you enjoyed that. See you soon. Bye.